Hello and welcome to the Extended Greg YouTube channel. I'm Greg and on today's show we're going to be talking about broadcast audio and video routers. These are used to be able to convey video signals back and forth between sources and destinations uh, to be able to kind of tie everything together and make everything a little bit easier. Uh, we'll go into a little bit about the history everything else like that. Before we do that, let's just get into what they're used for. So broadcast audio and video routers, they're used to allow a large selection of sources to be available to many destinations. They can send the same source to many destinations at the same time, similar to a DA, but still, it's selectable and agile, and is often used as a common point of convergence for all signals to reduce the amount of duplicate equipment. They used to have to have significant amounts of equipment in order to be able to amplify signals and be able to pass them back and forth and then also patch into them uh, to be able to uh, get signals from one end to the other. So the router, the router takes that and makes it so it's more ergonomic, I would say. So it's less labor intensive to be able to do it and a lot more self-service for the users. So by having all of the signals go into and out of the router, or as many as, as possible, because of course they're limited by size, uh, it definitely makes things a lot easier. And then the term used to describe the connection between the source and the destination within the router when it is routed is called a cross point. So router control. While there is usually one frame that handles the signals, the control can be distributed to different locations. And the router panels, as they're called, are usually placed adjacent to the destination device for easy access to source selection. And then router panels may be physical panels, but they can also be virtual panels. So you could have a piece of software on your computer that you would log into and be able to make those source selections uh, pretty much from anywhere uh, using a web page generally or a specific application. And then router panels can also protect and lock routes to prevent changes. So for example, let's say you have cameras going into a switcher or you have a switcher output going to air. Uh, you don't want those to be changed inadvertently because it can potentially put the wrong content uh, somewhere at a very inopportune moment. And usually it is often the way it goes if it happens at all. So the best practice is to actually lock or protect the route. So this is an example of a router panel. So when we say physical router panel, this is kind of the thing that we mean. And this is an older one. This is from uh, 2012. Um, and it's an old ProBell router, which has been brought, bought out. And you know, those companies get bought by other companies all the time. So the names constantly change, but the overall environment, the overall concepts remain consistent uh, across all of them. Pretty much, the way that these work is you would select your destination. This happens to be an XY panel, as they're called, because it can do multiple destinations opposed to just a single uh, destination. But so right here, they've selected their particular destination. The preset is bars and tone. So what that means is that they have a test signal that has uh, valid bars, but then also uh, generated tone signal uh, for calibration of equipment, things of that nature. They have that preset, so when they hit the take button down here, that will be taken. Um, in this particular case, they also have it routed currently to whatever this uh, particular destination is, 5, 2-5, or something of that nature. Um, and at this point, they have it locked. So there's a little key symbol here. Uh, this little yellow box here would be for protect. but. If they didn't have, like this is a quick take panel on the right over here. So if they didn't have the source that they wanted, for this particular thing, they can scroll through the destinations, they can hit the desk source select, it'll change this arrow, and then hit the up and down arrows to be able to choose a preset that doesn't appear on the quick, on the, uh, quick punch panel. So, and we see the protect, we see clear, things of that nature. So in short, there's a lot of uh, flexibility and when, we talk about levels in regards to routers, as we see here. Uh, we see there's eight of them. Uh, a lot of them have many more nowadays, um, but you'll have video, you'll have audio, uh, you can have multiple audio. Uh, you can also have other things like ancillary data, uh, things like that. And you can do what's called either, you know, you can do a full route where you're routing the entire signal, which includes audio, which includes ancillary data 
things of that nature. Uh, but you can do what's called a breakaway route, where you only choose one of them. So let's get into it really quick. So let's start with this, with kind of the history of exactly how we got here. Uh, not specific history, but more of the equipment that we would be using to be able to uh, do this if we didn't have a router. So back in the day, we had uh, what was called a patch bay. Right, and the patch bay was full of individual jacks. Right, and usually it would have a lot more than this, but I'm only going to talk about uh, just three types of configuration. So I think it kind of conveys the purpose. So this is a patch bay. Right, it can also be referred to as a jack field because it's just a bunch of jacks, things like that. And on the back of these, you'd have your sources and you'd have your destinations. Pretty much under normal circumstances and it would have a sig their signal would automatically go from the top to bottom. And that's what's known as a full normal patch bay. Right? So the signal automatically goes from the top to the bottom and if you plug a cable into the top, you know, this connection between the top and the bottom would cut out. And same thing if you plugged into the bottom, the connection between the two would cut out. And that's what a full normal patch bay is. And this is often used for video. You'd be able to plug in anywhere and everything would just work. And the reason it's used for video is because let's say you wanted to plug in this source to somewhere else. Video is a higher frequency than audio is. And as far as signal reflections, especially in the analog world, things like that, but it does impact digital as well. Uh, you can get a reflection from an end of the from the end of a cable if there's not enough load to be able to keep it from reflecting. And you know, as the frequency gets higher and higher, this becomes more of an issue. Since you can only have one terminator per signal, otherwise the load gets too great, and especially with analog video, the effect would be that it would reduce the brightness of the image since it was loading it down. So if you plugged into something and it was in use, it would actually cause the brightness to cut down a significant amount, a noticeable amount, to where you wouldn't want to have it on air. So it's actually better just to cut it off entirely so that way you know somebody patched into it incorrectly, opposed to having it be in a degraded state. So that's why full normal patch bays are desirable and are often used for video. Now for audio, it's not as susceptible. So we have something called half normal, right? And this has the same connection from top to bottom, but it will only cut this connection if you plug into the bottom one. If you plug into the top, that connection between the top and bottom jack stays present, right? And this is used for audio. So when you're actually plugging into it, you know, if you plug in a new signal into your destination, great, okay, it cuts it off. Now you only have that, so you don't have combining of two signals going together. It just is that one. But if you just want to monitor it and check it to make sure that the source is working, you can plug into it and it won't impact the audio going to the destination. And then we have a, a third type of patch bay, which is called non-normal, right? So a non-normal patch bay has no connection between the top and the bottom. And this is often used when you have incompatible top and bottom, right? I'm not going to, I'm just going to put DAs here and I'll tell you why. So if you had a DA on your patch bay, it's going to have one input and then it's going to have a whole bunch of outputs. So instead of just taking up your whole patch bay, which is the outputs and leaving the bottom unused, what you'll often do is put them top and bottom. So output one, output two, output three, output four, etc. down the line to be able to patch into those to be able to use it somewhere. But there's no reason for them to ever be attached together. So you would use a non-normal patch point, non-normal patch bay to be able to make that available without having to go through and you know use a bunch of rack space and a bunch of patch bay space. Uh, to be able to do that. So these are the three core types. And a lot of what we see in routers is based upon uh, this history that we have with patch bays. 
where these kinds of functions are able to replace destination uh, sources routed to destinations um, just with the click of a button. So instead of having any kind of physical cable, things like that, that would be going between two jacks on this jack field, on this patch bay, you can now replace that with something that's solid state and controlled through an interface. So let's start with like a very simple router, okay? And this is like usually, it's called a switch, but you probably have one at your TV at, on your TV at home. So we're gonna say we have a couple of inputs, right? We'll call this HDMI 1, we'll call this one HDMI 2, and this one HDMI 3, right? And then we have an output that goes to our monitor. So there's only one output bus, but multiple input buses. It's a very basic kind of idea. And we can choose one of those at a time, right? So we just created a cross point between HDMI 1 and the monitor, right? So HDMI 2 is not connected, HDMI 3 is not connected. And I find that this type of diagram is a great way to represent it if you need to show any kind of cross point. It's just have vertical lines coming in, horizontal lines going out, label both of them, and then just put the X where the cross point exists. And it just helps you be able to do it more graphically because especially if your inputs and outputs aren't changing, you can turn this into a worksheet and be able to use it multiple times. That being said, if your router's gigantic, you know, over, I would say anything over 32, for example, it would probably be too big for this style and you would just do uh, source destination naming and just write it out. But for smaller routers, smaller switches, things of that nature, uh, it's a good way to visually depict it and make it so you're just, you know, checking the box or putting the X, you know, where you need it. So, this is the cross point and it just shows the connection, HDMI 1 going to the monitor out. So when we actually look at a larger router, it's the same thing, but just duplicated many, many more times. So let's draw that really quick. It's still going to be kind of small, but we're going to show a different aspect to this, which is multiple outputs, right? And we'll just call this cam one, cam two, and test bars, which is what we saw on the router panel picture earlier, right? And then we have, let's say, three outputs. So we see how it's similar to the single bus diagram. In this case, let's say we have a monitor, we have a recorder, and let's say we have an encoder. Okay, so those are our three outputs. These are our destinations. These are our sources. So if we wanted to take a look at test bars on our monitor to be able to calibrate it, we can route that, create the cross point between test bars as our source going to our monitor. And that pretty much gets us the signal that we want at the destination we want. For our recorder, we can choose something completely different. So we can choose camera one. So now camera one goes through and goes to the recorder without interrupting monitor or anything else like that. And for our coder, let's say we wanted to check that as well. So we could put that also on test bars. So that did not impact what the monitor was doing. It doesn't impact what the monitor was seeing because it's creating its own amplified signal, the same as a DA would, and that sends it out to the encoder. So the encoder seeing what they want, the monitor seeing what they want, and neither of them is impacting the recorder, which is doing its own thing here with camera one. The user can go through and using the control panel that we saw, they can change these cross points based on the kind of content that they wanna see or they need to see for a particular uh, production need. So hope that makes everything a little bit clearer in terms of what routers do and what their function is within the broadcast environment. Uh, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button and hit that notification bell. That way you know the next time we're getting extended. So until next time, take care.